you get personal, say, you have won for me. Come on, say, death could not hold you. Amen, saints. Um, Brother Loxley Smith here again from Sonship Training Center. And we have just, the Lord has laid in our heart to just share a few thoughts and healing. In fact, I'm sharing from a booklet that I wrote on the subject because so many Christians are having problems in believing whether God will heal or not. Um, so I'm, I laid a foundation, many of the Old Testament areas coming up now. I don't want to go a little further. Now, we know that God is omnipotent, so healing is not a problem for God. I mean, I'm trying to lay a scriptural foundation that there are clear scriptural foundations laid for healing both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament and I've given you a lot of scriptures in Job and we're going to go further but but let me say something that may may help you may help you in this regard the scriptures do not have a positive view of sickness you, and it's difficult for you to believe God for healing if you do not have a similar view. I'm going to give you three passages. I'm going to go from Old Testament to New Testament to show you. The scriptures do, does not have. In fact, let me just dismiss something because some people think that they are Job and they are suffering in the flesh because of, you know, Job ultimately was healed. He did not remain sick. And his trial never lasts for years. Secondly, you are not Paul suffering with any thorn in the flesh. The reason why Paul had a thorn in the flesh is because he had an abundance of revelation. And God did not want him to rock in pride. And it did not say he was sick. It just said it was a messenger of Satan that buffeted him. Persecution everywhere we went. So I'm trying to say, I'm just dismiss this thing, erroneous thing about you having Paul's thorn in the flesh. You don't qualify. I don't qualify. I do not have, you do not have the abundance of revelation that Paul have. Okay? Let's get dismissed that. Now, in Job chapter 42, 10. And I want to look at that verse because and see what God calls what Job went through to dismiss certain things. Job 42, 10. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Notice also the Lord gave Job twice as he had before. So what Job went through, the sickness and all that he went through is called captivity. In Luke chapter 13 verse 11 and verse 16, let me, I want to repeat because it's very, I want to mention this very clearly. And Jesus says, let's, let's see what the passage says. Behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity, this said the Holy Spirit, 18 years, and was bound together and could in no wise lift herself up. And jump down to verse 16, it says, And Jesus said, Ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan had bound, lo, these 18 years, be loose from this bond on the Sabbath. So this sickness here in this is called bondage. Job, it was called captivity. Now, Acts 10 38. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed. So it is called oppression. All that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. And the word oppressed here is a very strong word. Do not stay no, meaning to overpower or to exercise control over. Or to use power against. So notice, the scriptures do not have a positive view of sickness, as so many Christians today have. It's called bondage, it's called captivity, it's called oppression. So if you don't have a proper attitude to sickness, it is difficult to believe God for healing. Especially if you believe it's a blessing from God. And if you believe sickness is a blessing from God and you're sick, you should not ask, ask God for more. You don't ask God for more sickness. No. Now, let me mention something that James also says in James 1, 17. Every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Good gifts come from God. 
foundation, very important foundation. In the scriptures, you're going to find there's a close relationship between forgiveness of sin and healing. This is from Old Testament. Psalm 103, classic passage that everybody likes to read. Bless the Lord of my soul, all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord of my soul and forget not all his benefits. And the psalmist is not going to list the benefits. Forgive it all thine iniquities. All. Forgive it. Heal it all thy diseases. Not some. All iniquities forgiven. All diseases healed. Redeem it thy life from destruction. Crown it thee with love and kindness and tender mercies. Satisfy thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed as the eagles. I, I, I alluded to that earlier in this first message about God renewing your youth like he did for Sarah. Isaiah 33 verse 24, powerful scripture again. And the inhabitant shall not say, I am sick. Why? The people that therein dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. I'm trying to show you the link between forgiveness of sin and healing. Now, let's go to Luke chapter 5. And the whole thing is covered in verses 17 to 26. Luke 5. But in verse 20, this man was sick and was brought to Jesus. And Jesus deals with root first before he deals with fruit. He goes to the root of the problem. And in verse 20 he says, And when he, Jesus, saw their faith when they brought the man, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is, let's speak it, blasphemous? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived, hallelujah, their thoughts, he answered and said unto them, What? reason you in your hearts whether it is easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee or to say rise up and walk but that you may know that the son of man had power upon earth to forgive sins he said unto the sick of the palsy paralytic man arise take up thy couch and go into thine house and immediately he arose before them and took up bearing he lay and departed his own house notice glorifying god because of the healing now, these passages I've shared, and those have, I'm trying to establish the biblical principle in the mouth of more than one witness. God wants us to experience both forgiveness of sins and physical healing. Because the root of sickness stems from Father Adam's sin, as we covered in the first lesson. Therefore, when the sin question is dealt with through forgiveness, the cause of sickness, the fundamental cause of sickness, is removed, allowing healing to come to the physical body. Now, let me tell you why this is also important for us who are men of God preaching the gospel. We put a disjuncture between forgiveness of sin and healing physically. When we tell people, and you know, I was telling some saints recently, fellowshipping with some saints, and I said to them, if the people knew the Bible, many of us as preachers that run us, we tell them that they get the greatest miracle of all, salvation, by accepting Jesus. But at the same time, we can't give them a lesser miracle of healing of their physical body. You know what Jesus is tying forgiveness and healing? Now, again, there's a close relationship between forgiveness of sins and physical healing. Now let's go to the pivotal, pivotal chapter in the Bible concerning this matter of what Jesus has provided for us in Isaiah 53. Let's look at this. Who had believed your report? We must believe the report to benefit from it. And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? And the arm or the power of the Lord is revealed to those who believe the report. For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He had no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now I'm going to draw some things to show you the completeness of healing provided in this Isaiah 53 passage. He is despised, that's emotional aspect, rejected rejection of men, 
a man of sorrows, and the word sorrows is the Hebrew word makob, meaning grief and pain. He's a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and the word grief here literally means sickness. Mak, word here for grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He despised and we esteemed him not. Surely, no doubt, let it be settled. He had born, the Hebrew here for born, is Nasa, mean to lift, to carry, carry away, to forgive, vicariously as a substitute. He has, surely, he had lifted, carried away, all griefs, and that word here now, is malady, anxiety, calamity, disease, sickness. All is implied in the word here. And carried, kobal, the Hebrew, meaning to be burdensome, he has taken the burden, carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. And this word afflicted here meaning to browbeat, to obey self. And this is talking about emotional provision. Now, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Talking about the spiritual provision. The chastisement of our peace, shalom, safe, happy, friendly, healthy, prosperity, good health, total wholeness. From the root word shalom, meaning to be safe in mind, body, or estate, or to be made completed, to be friendly, to be at peace, to prosper, recompense, make restitution, or restore. All of that is wrapped up here. Chastisement of our peace was upon him, was upon him as our substitute that we can get the wholeness. And with the stripes, we are healed. So as we can see from the above passages, spiritual, emotional, bodily healing is provided in the substitutionary death of Jesus for us. And to prove the point that our redemption in Christ includes total healing, total holistic healing, we should note that the common verb for save in the New Testament, sozo, the noun soterion, remember I mentioned it, conveys the idea of wholeness or perfect sound. So the word translated, for example, Romans 10, though shall be saved, is the same word sozo. And it is used, for example, in Mark 6, 56, as many sick persons as touch him or made whole, the word sozo, or wholeness. No Christian would deny that Christ's suffering still atones for our sins today. Why then should we imagine that healing is not for today? Since he was a healing God in the Old Testament, is he not a healing God today in the New Testament where we have a better covenant? better promises better mediator better priesthood everything is better that's what the book of hebrews is telling us is he not still jehovah rapha the lord or healer or physician i am the lord i change not is god inconsistent to do something for the old testament people but won't do it for us today his will is unchanging the theologians have robbed us by only emphasizing, and many of us as preachers, the spiritual aspect. So, so much of the other benefits of what Jesus has provided are not preached. But let me go a little further in the ministry of Jesus in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. Matthew 8, 16 and 17. When the evil was come, they brought unto him many that were possessed with devils. And he cast out the spirits with his word. And healed all that were sick. Here, <laughs> why? The next verse explains something. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, which was in Isaiah 53. Himself, that is Jesus as our substitute, took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. Now, <laughs> Very interesting. I believe the above scriptures clearly reveal 
that Jesus surely was our substitute, providing a substitutionary atonement, that we might be healed spiritually, emotionally, and physically or bodily. If he bore these things for us, let us press on by faith and obtain all that Jesus, this burial and resurrection has provided. Let's go a little further. Now, Jesus is perfect theology. If you understand God, look at Jesus and his ministry. If healing was not a part of the will of God, you have no record of anybody coming to Jesus for healing and was not healed. And he's a perfect expression. He says, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, the psalmist said in Psalm 40, verse 6 to 8, to do thy will. So everything that Jesus did was the will of God. Not one person ever came to Jesus for healing and was not healed. And the same thing is picked up in Hebrews chapter 10, where the writer of the Hebrews picks up the 10. Lo, I come in the volume of the book to do thy will, O God. So Jesus is a perfect expression of the will of God. So if Jesus was healing people contrary to the will of God, there would have been confusion. Now, let's go further. Let's spend, spend some more time dealing with this matter of the will of God and healing. Let's look at a few passages. Mark chapter 1. Gospel of Mark 1, verse 40 and 41. And there came a leper to him, beseeching him, and kneeling down to him, and saying unto him, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand, touched him, and said unto him, I will be thou clean. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy departed from him, and he was cleansed. Now, again, this passage would not be important if we do not know that Jesus was the perfect expression of the will of God. So if he was healing co <laughs> contrary to, <laughs> to the will of God, there would be confusion. Now, notice what Jesus said about his own life. J John chapter 4, verse 34. Jesus said unto them, My meat or my food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. John chapter 5 verse 30 I can of mine own self do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will but the will of the Father which has sent me and let's go to Hebrews as I alluded to earlier Hebrews 10 5 to 7 wherefore when he cometh into the world Jesus he said sacrifice and offering though it's not but a body has not prepared me in burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin though has no pleasure then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me, to do thy will, O God. Now, the argument could be made by some that the case of the leper was situation specific and is not a general demonstration of the will of God. But let us look further. Why did he teach us to pray in what we call the Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 12? After this man I pray, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So, Jesus says, God's will must pray to be done on earth as in heaven. Is there any sickness in heaven? He wants heavenly conditions to come to earth. And the coming of the kingdom includes the casting out of the devil's which oppress people at times, both physically and emotionally. So God desires that his will be done on earth as in heaven. And we know, I repeat, there's no sickness in heaven. Now, let's go a little further, because some may still have doubts about it. Jesus sent the disciples with a commission to heal the sick. And he has never commissioned anybody we see in the scriptures. Send them to preach the gospel of the kingdom. You can preach church. But you, you cannot preach the gospel of the kingdom without the signs and wonders, including healing. For the kingdom of God is not in word. What is demonstration of the spirit and power? Righteousness, shalom, righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. That's what the kingdom is. So a lot of people, we are preaching church and not the kingdom. And a lot of people talking about kingdom, but it's not being demonstrated. Now, Jesus is sending out the twelve. Notice what he says. Matthew chapter 10 verse 1. And as he go preach saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. 
heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely have received, freely give. No charge for it. No charge. That's it been abused today now. You can't get anything from God unless you give God some money seed. Stop it. At God's God will prompt people at times to give, but don't make it look as if if you don't give you got the greatest miracle of all salvation. You never got give give God any money. Why all of a sudden no? Anything you get from God, you have to sow a money seed. Come balance this thing. Balance it, Virgin. He not only sent out the ten, but look at the seventy, what he sent in Luke chapter ten, verse seventeen. Or what they came back and they gave them the commission. The Luke 10 17. The 70 returned and gave rejoice, saying, Lord, even the devils, the demons, are subject to us through thy name. Now, Mark 16, 16, and 17 says, These signs shall follow any believer. So it's not just the 12, the 70, any believer. Lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. In fact, let me bring something to your attention. The admonition in the scripture many times is not. To pray for the sick is to heal the sick. The admonition in the scripture primarily is not to pray for the sick, but to heal the sick. Think about that. The preaching of the kingdom involves casting out of devils and healing the sick. Now, I don't want us to fall into what we could call the Gnostic error that the body is not important. So physical healing is not important. The scriptures say that the body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And in addition, Paul in writing in 1 Corinthians 6 20 says this For we are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. John in 3 John verse 2 expresses a similar thing. Beloved, I wish above all things that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Now, this is very important what John says. Because you cannot be in health physically if our soul, intellect, emotion, and will is not prospering. You must focus on these things. So I Philippians 4 talk about whatever things are true, whatever things are God, what's in of a good report? Think on these things. God, the root determines the fruit. Now, we are laying a foundation for you. And there's a booklet here. I've put a lot of these thoughts in cause towards a balanced theology of healing, which if you desire, you can contact the ministry and we, we make it available to you. But what I'm saying to you is this. Lord, just let me to the switch from what I've been teaching on prayer on this matter of healing. Because there are so many Christians right now even afraid. And fear will open you up to sickness, in fact, with this corona thing. And we are in the decade that started, 2020, of the pay. The Hebrew word for speech and confession and declaration. Notice what has happened with corona. Yeah, we are masks now, you can't declare certain things. And we are content, many of us, in not opening our mouth and declaring things for... So what I'm saying to you is this. We are coming to the end of this program. And let's pray. Father, we thank you. We magnify you. We glorify your name. I thank you, Father, that as my elder brother, my Lord and Savior said, Jesus, you always hear me. And Lord, those who are hearing me now, I send a word of healing and deliverance to them right now. For healing physically, for healing emotionally in the name of Jesus I break the power of the enemy spirits of infirmity spirits of bondage in the name of Jesus I declare liberty in the name of Jesus free from oppression free from depression in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus and I want to put you on the ground where you can get these things as I said forgiveness of sins is a package first healing god can reverse it people come to church and they and i believe and god will heal them but the normal process forgiveness of sin so let's lead you in a prayer of faith just pray along with brother lastly father i come to you in the name of jesus your son resurrected and glorified seated at your right hand even now 
I accept Jesus, the one who died for my sin, as my Savior and my Lord. And I claim the benefits of this salvation, including healing and deliverance from the power of darkness. Because you said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So I come into agreement with the word, knowing that you watch over your word to perform it. And I claim in the name, which is above every other name, the name of the resurrected, glorified Jesus. Salvation, healing, deliverance, and shalom, wholeness. Wholeness. In the mighty name of Jesus. So let it be written, so let it be done. In Jesus' name, amen. You're seated in majesty. Yeah.